you are all welcome to this session of our lectures. We'll be discussing acute management of funds. So if you have questions, you can take down your questions. After the lecture, we will entertain a question and answer session. Okay, bonds is defined as a coagulative necrosis of the skin and underlying structures. An area of coagulative necrosis of the skin and, sub and subcutaneous tissue that results from injury by thermal, electrical, chemical, or radiation and is accompanied by systemic derangement in moderate to major cases. Now, you should know that bonds do not only affect the local site that is involved. The bonds injury lead to generation of a lot of mediators that triggers a systemic response to the injury. Now, bonds commonly affect the very young and the very old because these are vulnerable. They are vulnerable to bonds, okay? The very unfortunate and the careless the under five children are more at risk of bonds and they contribute to the high mortality of bonds injury. The incidence of bonds in developing countries is not precisely known. This is a young lady that was assaulted with chemical you can see how she sustained uh, bonds in various parts of her body. These bonds is already granulating. Okay, this is an example of an assault from bonds. These are typical scenarios you see. Okay, uh, careless handling of petroleum products, careless exposure of children, road traffic accidents, other house fires, bomb blasts and explosions. These are various scenarios that can lead to bonds. I know most of you don't even some of you don't have never used this before okay this is lantern kerosene lantern if you go to villages up till now they use something like this okay uh, from careless lantern refill when it is burning you are adding fuel to it they can be um, explosion and it will just involve some of the materials in the house would like curtains and so on. Now commonly you can see cases where a generator is working and somebody is refueling it. It's also a case of explosion. So classification of bonds. Bonds are classified based on the etiology, based on the depths of the bonds, and also the extent of the bonds. These are various ways bonds are classified. Based on the etiology, it could be a thermal bonds, chemical bonds, electric bonds, friction bonds, or bonds resulting from ionizing radiation. When you say thermal bonds from heat, it could be moist heat. Bonds from hot liquid is called scald injury. Okay, 
from hot liquids, it's called scald injury. This hot liquid could be in form of steam. Okay, this is a gaseous liquid or liquid form. So thermal burns could either be moist, which will lead to scald injury or from dry heats resulting from flames. This can also result from contacts with hot objects. Like metals. So that is thermal buns, which could be hot or dry heat. It could be chemical buns. Chemical buns could either be acid buns, alkali buns or other caustic chemicals. It could be from electricity, friction burns, or burns resulting from ionizing radiation. So this classification is based on etiology of burns. Based on the depth, Buns are classified as superficial, okay, it could be partial or full thickness. Based on the depth of the buns, it is classified as partial thickness buns or full thickness buns. The partial thickness is further classified into superficial partial thickness or deep partial thickness okay now when you say partial thickness it involves the epidermis when you say full thickness it and it involves the entire layers of the skin okay the epidermis and epidermis. So superficial partial thickness involves only the epidermis, only. Deep partial thickness, it involves some varying degree of the dermis, not the entire degree, not the entire thickness of the dermis, but some layers of the dermis while full thickness will involve the entire thickness of the skin. Based on the degree of burns, it is classified, or based on the severity, it is classified as first, second, third, or even fourth degree burns. First degree burns, you can see, it will involve the epidermis. Second degree will involve the epidermis and the dermis. Third degree will, entire, will involve the entire um, epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous tissue. Now, for fourth degree burns, it will involve even the muscle and the bones. Based on the extent, it is categorized into minor, moderate, or severe, um, or major. This is also called major bonds. Okay, so based on the extent, commonly, traditionally, it is minor and major bonds. Okay but you can further classify it as minor, moderate, um, and major bonds. Now, these have clinical significance, which we'll see shortly. 
Minor bonds. What are minor bonds? When superficial bonds involve less than 15% of total body surface area, it is minor bonds. Superficial bonds, we talk that is involving the epidemics and some varying degree of dermis. When the total body surface area involved is less than 15% in adults, while less than 7.5% total body surface area in children and elderly is still regarded as minor bonds. Or when a full thickness less than 2%, okay, is also regarded as minor bonds. So please, you should be careful about the percentages involving superficial as well as full thickness, also in adult and pediatric age group. Moderate bonds, a mixed partial and full thickness injury of 15 to 25% in adults, 7.5 to 12.5% injury in patients less than 10 years or greater than 40 years, 2 to 10% full thickness bonds are regarded as moderate bonds. Major bonds are bonds that require hospitalization for care. And the criteria for defining a major bonds is when a partial thickness bond of greater than 25% total body surface area or a full thickness bonds greater than 10% total body surface area. Bonds of special areas. Special areas include face, eyes, ears, hands, feet, or perineum, or even flexural surfaces of joints. Flexural surfaces of joints high voltage electric bonds, bonds with inhalational injury, bonds with other major trauma, significant chemical injury. Now, what is the pathophysiology of bonds response? The pathophysiology of bonds response. Now, the pathophysiology could either be local or generalized. So there are some certain sequence of events that occur at the local site of the injury and they also trigger a systemic response. Now at the local site, Skin injury results from two factors, immediate direct cellular injury from the energy that is generated from the source of bonds, delayed injury from progressive dermal ischemia. So the etiology could result uh, from an immediate cellular injury or it could result from the ischemia. Mediators from tissue destruction. When a tissue is destroyed, mediators are liberated, which trigger a systemic response. Now, from this image, you can see at the local site, okay? 
there are various zones at the local site. Burns cause coagulating necrosis, okay, with disruption of the basement membrane of epithelial lining, blistering from accumulation of serum and some vascular changes like vasodilatation. And the zones are categorized into two, uh, into three, sorry, the Jacksonian model that describe the local changes at the site of injury. The site of maximal impacts is the zone of coagulation, okay? Is central, the site of maximal impact is the zone of coagulation. Now, just peripheral to the zone of coagulation is the zone of stasis. And the outermost part is the zone of hyperemia. The implication here is at the zone of coagulation, there is an irreversible tissue damage. Okay, there is already a coagulative necrosis of the protein while in the zone of stasis with adequate perfusion, with adequate resuscitation of the patient, the microtrombi that has, all the microtrombi that have clocked the microcirculation can be dislodged and there will be adequate microcirculation. Then the zone of hyperemia, okay, will heal, okay? Now, the aim of your adequate resuscitation is to convert the zone of stasis to the zone of hyperemia, okay? If there is no adequate resuscitation, the zone of stasis will worsen to the zone of coagulation. What are the systemic response? Now it is important for you to know that systemic response occur when the bonds involve more than 30% of the total body surface area. And it is associated with high levels of circulating mediators, edema occur even in non-born tissues. <coughs> Excuse me. So it should be clear that systemic edema that occur, it is not only in the involved tissues. There is bones edema involving both the bond tissue as well as the non bond tissues. There is increased evaporative loss of fluid greater than one mil per kg per hour and may cause up to 50% of ECF loss. This is important it may cause up to 50% of ECF loss, okay? So, this is very important. You will see shortly, just take note of this. Evaporation can cause up to 50% of ECF loss. Later, we'll be making a reference to this 50%. Systemic response also lead to immunosuppression. Now, the pathophysiology of edema, basically it's increased capillary 
permeability and loss of fluid into the interstitial space, okay? As we already mentioned, loss of cutaneous barrier function leads to insensible loss of fluid and heat. So there is fluid loss, which will lead to dehydration, and there is um, heat loss that will lead to hypothermia. Now, increased capi uh, capillary permeability leads to edema. There is um, within the bones tissue, okay? Maximally within eight to 12 hours post bone, the maximal edema, okay? Systemically, if bonds is more than 15 to 20%, you know this requires fluid resuscitation. Now, don't forget these two values. Number one, when bonds is more than 30%, we said, the systemic response. Two, when bonds involve 15 to 20 percent it requires fluid resuscitation okay for systemic response 30 percent any bonds up to 15 to 20 percent requires fluid resuscitation okay and this loss of fluid is clinically significant by two to three hours and most rapid in the first six to eight hours, okay? So your resuscitation should be more rapid in the first eight hours from the time of burns because that is when most fluid is lost from the body and you now continue your maintenance fluid because there is slow, uh, continuous and progressive loss for the next 18 to 24 hours. And that could persist up to 72 hours. So patients have to be on maintenance fluid because of fluid loss from burns. And the resolution is slow, okay? It depends on patient as well as bonds, the extent of bonds. Now, edema also cause reduce oxygen delivery to tissue, to surrounding tissue, okay? Causes are poorly elucidated by many components have, have been implicated Okay, so the causes of this edema is not clear. So, but it is shown that the mucus release release from the local tissue destruction are the agents that leads to edema. Now you can see the capillary pressure is the pressure that filters fluid out into the interstitial space, while the oncotic pressure is the pressure that keeps fluid within the space. And this is determined by the proteins within the plasma. So with Burns injury, and destruction of the capillary lining. There is flow of fluid into the interstitial space and this will cause edema. So there is loss of fluid and protein into the interstitial space, which will cause more edema. Now, what are the hematological and cardiovascular changes that occur in burns? The hematologic changes, there is increased hematocrit due to loss of plasma. So you get a falsely elevated 
PCV because PCV depends on plasma level. So erythrocyte red blood cells are damaged, okay, and there's extravasation and stasis injury. And because of the stasis, there is microtrombi that clogs microcirculation. There is impaired microcirculation. Now, what are the hemodynamic consequences that occur? Okay, there is decreased cardiac output due to decreased blood volume circulating myocardial depressant from the substances released as a result of tissue injury, increased systemic vascular resistance. Increased systemic vascular resistance is a result of sympathetic stimulation from the catecholamine release, and this causes widespread vasoconstriction, okay? of the arterioles. Vasopressin angiotensin II and neuropeptide Y. There is pulmonary edema, okay? There is increased peripheral vascular resistance. There is hypoproteinemia, left heart failure. This do does not necessarily occur Okay, if no inhalational component. <coughs> the gastrointestinal system, they could have a dynamic ileus, okay, and this will predispose them to vomiting and aspiration. There is gastric dilatation. You need. you need to pass NG tube during your resuscitation because with gastric dilatation and ileus, there is accumulation of fluid which will predispose patient to vomiting and aspiration. There is delay in gastric emptying. There is gastrointestinal hemorrhage, okay? And this hemorrhage could be massive. And this is um, a result, this as a result of um, the catechola means other steroids that are released from the stress. So it's a form of stress ulcer. Okay. It's a form of stress ulcers that are formed. So there is decreased intestinal and colonic motility decreased mesenteric blood flow, decreased nutrient absorption, there is bacterial translocation. Now, because of decreased perfusion of the intestine, so there is loss of mucosal integrity, which will lead to translocation of bacteria into the systemic circulation leading to sepsis, okay? Patients will also have hepatic injury. Now, in the renal system, the excretory system, there is acute hypovolemia from third space loss, as we mentioned, leading to decreased renal blood flow and decreased glomerular filtration rates. And there is, <clears throat> there is the this is the hypovolemic phase at the acute time of the injury. During the phase of injury. There's loss of fluid, which will lead to hypovolemia, decrease glomerular filtration rate. <clears throat> the next phase is the hypermetabolic phase. At the hypermetabolic phase, after 
release of all the mediators. This increase renal blood flow and also increase GFR. And there's an accompanying impaired tubular function due to the renal tubules are loaded with a lot of myoglobins from destroyed muscles. Okay, and this pigment will reduce the function of the nephrons and they may block all the nephrons leading to acute renal failure. <clears throat> now the respiratory system, there is hypoxemia, pulmonary hypertension, increased airway resistance, decreased pulmonary compliance. So how do we manage burns injury? Now it should be clear the four R's of management. You resuscitate, revive, restore, rehabilitate patients. Now, at the pre-hospital stage, remove victim from the source of injury. Smother the flame, you extinguish the flame, remove the shouldering clothing. Okay? BLS, basic life support, if indicated. We talked about this when we discussed multiply injured patient. Apply clean water at the room temperature only, not cold water, because we say they are at risk of hypothermia. Transport to the hospital. Now you should know that when a patient is involved in maybe RTA or flame bonds or whatsoever, and he's lit up with flame. At the pre-hospital, that patient should drop a roll on the ground rather than running. If his clothing are caught on flame and he's running, he's further fueling the flame with oxygen and it will be burning more and more. <clears throat> so when he drops down a roll, he's going to lit off, put up the fire. So that is how you can put off fires by asking patient to drop a roll on the ground rather than running. If he runs, is as if he's swelling the fire. At reception in the hospital, you carry out the primary survey, which we discuss, primary survey and resuscitation, the A, B, C, D, E of resuscitation. Give oxygen, and intubate patients if indicated. Place an intravenous cannula through intact skin, preferably, or through burnt wound if there is no intact skin. Pass urethral catheter for major burns. Pass nasogastric tube in patients with major burns or bonds associated with severe trauma. We talked about the ileus, acute gastric dilatation and decreased gastric emptying. Obtain quick history, where, how, and when bonds occur. Now, the management protocol for acute bonds Acute bond treatment involves seven A's. 
The first A is the ABC of resuscitation, maintaining airway, breathing, circulation. The second A is anti-shock regimen, that is fluid administration. Third A is analgesics, you give opioids. Anti-tetanus, antibiotics, anti-ulcers, anticoagulants. Now, the initial management of severe bonds, you ensure patent airway, okay? You give IV fluids, copious irrigation of the bonds injury, copious irrigation of the bonds injury. Pass NG2, assess percentage bonds, because this is very important to administer IV fluids, okay? This is just a di uh, diagram representing the acute management of bone. Give tetanus, identify and treat associated injury. Of course, for major bones, you pass catheter. This is a child that suffers flame bones with facial injury. You can see the edema has involved the entire face, the eyes, the nostrils, okay? The airway has been compromised. So you can see a tracheostomy was passed for the child. Now, you take history and examine the patient. Do your baseline investigations. Management of inhalational injury, you have to administer oxygen, please. Oxygen, intubate the patient. If there is sign of inhalational injury, you have to intubate, don't wait for this stage. At this stage, there's already edema you can no longer intubate. The only thing you can do here is tracheostomy. You can see, don't wait for edema to develop. So immediately a patient present with features of inhalational injury, okay, facial burns, singeing of the nasal hairs, cough productive of darkish sputum, change of voice, all these are signs of inhalational injury. Don't wait for edema. Give nebulized salbutamol for some bronchodilatation and adequate ventilation. Now, Escarotomy or fasciotomy for circumferential deep. Okay. To full thickness bonds. When there is circumferential injury involving a limb or the chest, for the limb, it will cause compartment syndrome. You need to do an escarotomy or fasciotomy. There are two different procedures. This is incising the escar, while this is the fascial compartment. The investigations include full blood count, U and E, grouping and cross-matching, random blood sugar, gases, and x-ray when indicated. Now, this is how escarotomy is done. When the circumferential bonds, the escar causing compartment, you can make an incision on the escar to relieve that compartment. 
here also for the chest you make two incisions like this and connect them in the lower end so that you have you free the chest it can move without constriction look at the lower limb also now look at this circumferential full thickness bonds this is going to cause compartment syndrome if this s cap this bond tissue is called s cap so you make incision to release that compartment now before we go into the fluid administration let me just <clears throat> shed a little light on how these bonds will present okay now for partial thickness for superficial partial thickness they will have erythema okay they will have pains and they may have some blisters okay they have blisters erythema pain For deep partial thickness, they will have blisters, mottling of the skin, it will be wet. These blisters are bigger and they coalesce together to easily rupture. These blisters are smaller. Now for full thickness, where you have bonds of the entire skin, you will see <clears throat> the skin will become leathery, okay? going to be it's going to have some area of charring you will see areas of thrombosed vessels okay you see some vessels that are thrombosed okay like this you can see this is a full thickness you can see how the skin is shiny no blisters you can see some areas of thrombosed vessels like this, okay? Now, fluid administration for a bond patient. You use the Parkland formula as a guide to administer fluid. In the first 24 hours for fluid administration, you give four meals per kg multiplied by the percentage total body surface area involved okay that is times the weight of the patient so the parkland's formula is four times weight of the patient times percentage bonds okay now this is used for crystalloids. 
Ringer's lactate or normal saline. You use Parkland's formula for administration of crystalloids. Now in the first eight hours from the time of burns, not the time of presentation to the hospital, the time of burns, you give half of the estimated amount of fluid in the first eight hours from the time of burns, okay? And the other half is given in the remaining 16 hours. Now for children that are less than 30 kg, this formula you must add there plus daily maintenance. which is 100 mils per kg in the first 10 kg, 50 mils per kg in the next 10 kg, and 20 mils per kg in the third 10 kg. So, so that you don't underestimate the requirements in children. And not only that, you use three instead of four. So Parkland's formula when applied to children is three times weight times percentage bonds plus daily maintenance of that child. Now, you remember, I, I told you about the 50% extracellular fluid loss in bonds. Now it is shown that the total or the maximal amount of fluid that is lost from the extracellular space does not exceed 50%. So even if you have a bonds of 80% total body surface area. The maximum amount you use in the Parkland's formula is 50%. Let's take a clinical scenario, okay? A 24-year-old was involved in a flame burns. He is 60 kg and a total body surface involved was 80%. Calculates the fluid requirement of this patient. So using the Parkland's formula, the fluid requirement will be four times weight, which is 60 times percentage bonds. Because his percentage bonds is more than 50%, is 80, we will use 50 as the maximum. Because the total extracellular loss does not as exceed 50%. So this is his fluid estimate. So the first half of what you calculated will be given in eight hours from the time of bonds. The second half will be given in the next 16 hours from the time of bonds. Okay. <clears throat> so the aim of this resuscitation, you want to achieve a urine output of 30 mils, 30 to 50 mils in an adult per hour, a blood pressure of greater than 100 diastolic, and a pulse rate of less than 110 beats per minute. What are the limitations of the Parkland formula? It underestimates fluid needs in children. Parkland's formula underestimates fluid needs in children. That's why 
you have to add the daily maintenance fluid for children, as we mentioned. It underestimates electric burns. It underestimates inhalational injury. And there is a delay in resuscitation because you have to start estimating the fluid requirement. Parkland's formula overestimates, okay, fluid load when there is cardiopulmonary disease. Okay, invasive monitoring is indicated. Pharmacologic support needed. <clears throat> now, monitoring of a born patient. Monitoring of a born patient. You monitor the clinical response of your resuscitation. You monitor the vital signs of the patient, the pulse rate of the patient, respiratory rate, blood pressure, okay? Examine the chest and the CNS. You have to ensure patient is making adequate urine output. For children, adequate urine output is one to two mils per kg per hour, while in adults is 0 0.5 to one mils per kg per hour. You have to do serial monitoring of the pack cell volume because burns will lead to red blood cell destruction. And initially, there is hemoconcentration because of the fluid loss. So after resuscitation, you need to repeat the PCV. If there is anemia, you group and cross-match and transfuse the patient. Any electrolyte derangement should be corrected. So you have to do electrolytes, creatinine, urea electrolyte and creatinine. If you see electrolyte arrangement, you correct. Pulse oximeter to monitor um, oxygen saturation. Arterial blood gases also is taken. Now, what are the indications for admission of a burns patient? The indications for admission, these, as we mentioned, burns that require hospitalization for care are called major burns. What are the indications for admission? Partial thickness burns more than 15%, okay, any age group. Partial thickness burns greater than 7.5% in children or less than 10%, sorry, or less than 10 years old and adults more than 50 years old. Full thickness burns more than 5% in adults. When there is significant burns involving functional or cosmetic impairment of face, hand, feet, genital, perineum, or major joint, it requires hospitalization. Chemical burns with risk of evolving above mentioned areas. Electrical burns including lightning injuries. Okay, burns with concomitant trauma, burns with inhalational injury. Okay. Patients with pre-existing medical disorders that could adversely affect patient care and outcome. For example, diabetes mellitus, sickle cell disease, epilepsy, asthma, and so on. Burns from child abuse. All these categories require hospitalization for care. Now, when you take history in burns, 
where, when it occurs, where and how it occurs. What is the etiological agent? Okay, you have to estimate the temperature of that agent and the duration of contact because the extent of bonds depends on one, the temperature of the agent and two, the duration of contacts, okay? The higher the temperature, the greater the extent of injury. The longer the duration of contact, the higher the extent of injury. What first aid was given? You know, sometimes you see they will just push patient into gutter, use sand, and uh, you see there's a lot of tetanus that can infect the wound, okay? So you have to ask for the first aid that was given, okay? All sorts of traditional things are applied on one's wound, okay? What clothing was on the patient at the time of bone? You know, leathery clothes, when the, the clothing is made of leathery material, you know, it will melt on patients and the contact time and the extent will, uh, will increase. The part of the body involved, you have to assess for respiratory burns, inhalational injury. What are the features you use to assess for that? When there is burns in an enclosed space, when there are signs of facial burns, okay? When there is brassy cough, carbonaceous putum, okay? Was of weak voice, strider, wheezes, breathlessness. You examine other systems and look for other injuries. What treatment patient have received and the past medical history. Now you can see this is hemoglobinuria or myoglobinuria. You can see the color from tissue destruction. A lot of myoglobin is released and excreted. And this can cause acute kidney injury because they will block all the renal tubules. You do a general physical examination systemic evalu evaluation, you have to assess the extent, okay, and the depth of the bone. You know, for partial thickness, they feel touch sensation and pain sensation. While for full thickness, okay, <clears throat> the, the, the entire skin and the receptors are burned. Uh, they are already burnt. They will not feel touch and pain sensation. They will not feel pain sensation, okay? Because the pain receptors are already burnt. Now, to assess the extent of burns, you use the wireless rule of nine, okay? The head and neck is 9%. The upper limb is 9%. You can see the palm is 1. Okay? The lower limb is 18%. Anterior trunk, 18 Posterior trunk, 18 <clears throat> You can see how you can further break down both the anterior and the posterior view when you are estimating. And the perineum is 1%, all making 100%. Now you can see the variation in infants. You see the head and neck is 18%. But you have a chart, the Lord and Brothers chart for estimating bonds in children. Now you can use the rule of palm 
where you get a filter paper and estimate the palmar surface of the patient, then you can use that paper to estimate the percentage bonds. This is the Lund and Brothers chart. It's not something you should memorize. This is something that's supposed to be at the accident and emergency. And you have, um, it varies with the age of the patient. Now, you can see what we were describing, the features for various thickness. Now for superficial burns, what is the color? It is red. It has a positive capillary refill. There is pain sensation and the blisters are negative, okay? If they are, they, if they are present, they are, they may be small as in superficial and some dermal parts in mysticness. <clears throat> and the healing, they completely recover, okay? They completely recover. Superficial dermal, they are pale pink. The capillary refill is positive. They have pain sensation, okay? And the blisters are small. The blisters are small. And the healing is complete. It heals by complete epithelization. And the epithelization grows from the skin appendages. Then when it's a mid dermal, it is dark pink. Capillary refill is slow. Sensation is still present and the blisters are large because smaller blisters will coalesce together and they easily rupture. Healing is usual. For deep dermal, it is a fixed stain. No capillary refill, no sensation, no blisters, no healing. It has to be grafted. It requires skin grafting. For full thickness, it is whitish or yellowish, and it is leathery. It is leathery. You will see thrombose veins. So this is the same thing we just described. You can see this patient. He has blisters. He has a mixed thickness. As you can see some area of full thickness here that are leathery, shiny, and you can see deep partial thickness, bigger blisters, and some areas of smaller blisters. If it's fair in complexion, you might see some areas of superficial burns. Now, if you notice the first aid was applied before presenting, this might be eggs. Some people, I don't know. They apply eggs to the bones area before presenting to the hospital. You can see this. You can see this also in mysticness. You can see some areas that are yellowish, some areas that are pinkish, some areas. Most of the bones, okay, you might see mixed thickness. Now, this is a full thickness bones. You can see this side is yellowish, leathery, some thrombosed veins, okay? And it's circumferential. Here you have to do an escarotomy to prevent compartment syndrome. It's also a full thickness. Now, what are the early wound treatments in bunds? You have to debride the wound, okay, and dress for partial thickness bunds. Now, for full thickness bonds, you have to do excision, okay? Excision and partial thickness skin grafting. You do a skin grafting. You get a partial thickness skin from other part of the body that is not burnt. Then you now graft the area. So, donor sites... Bonds 
won discrepancy. So you have to, um, you see, they say do not cite or bond wound discrepancy. When you have discrepancy between the uh, donor sites and the in involved area, you have to devise some ways in widening the graft. Can, there are several ways you can mesh it and it will cover. <clears throat> now, chemical burns is very important. Okay, it can be caused either by acid, alkali, or other chemicals. Acid causes coagulative necrosis, while alkali causes liquefactive necrosis. That's why alkali burns are more severe than acid burns because. Coagulative necrosis is coagulation of the upper layer and it prevents further penetration. While alkali burns is liquefactive, there is deeper penetration. Okay. Management of patients with chemical burns. Clothing and the causative agent should be removed from the patient. The wound should be copiously irrigated for up to one to two hours, okay? Sodium, potassium, lithium bomb should not be irrigated with water. Water can cause ignition of this substance. These burns should first be extinguished with a fire extinguisher. They should then be covered with oil to isolate the metal from any water. The nails, hair, and web space should be examined for traces of any residual chemical. Ocular injury should be excluded. Now, electric bonds could be classified as low voltage bond, high voltage bond, and extremely high voltage bonds. Low voltage bonds are those voltage in domestic appliances, okay? From your socket, from your light bulb. High voltage, bulb, uh, voltage burns are burns from transformers, high tension wires, more than 1000 volts. You have extremely high voltage, more than 10,000 volts. And these are seen in lightning, thunder strikes, okay? Can present with compartment syndrome, okay? They can abnormal heartbeats leading to arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, paresis, acute tubular necrosis, okay? And it will require fasciotomy instead of escarotomy. So there's a difference between fasciotomy and escarotomy. For escarotomy, you are making incision on the, the circumferential escar, which is the burnt outer covering. While fasciotomy, you have to go into the facial compartment of that limb and make incision on the fascia. Myoglobinuria and hemoglobinuria require hyperhydration okay, with a urine output of two mils per kg per hour and alkalinization of the urine, diuresis, and continuous PCG monitoring. You can see this victim of thunder, okay, strike, okay, this is lightning. He, he has completely lost the both limbs, okay, some facial and um, chest injuries. Okay, you can see these extensive bonds involving the genitals, the groin. Now rehabilitation. 
Now, the essence of rehabilitation is to prevent permanent disability. Okay, if disability already occur, you have to recuperate patients into the society. Okay, now, from time of presentation, you have to commence adequate resuscitation. to prevent development of complication. You elevate, give adequate bed rest, splintage to prevent contracture formation. Early physiotherapy accompanying with adequate analgesia, okay? You give you nutritional support, psychotherapy, social support, and occupational rehabilitation to incorporate patient into the society. <clears throat> complications of burns, the acute complications include hypovolemia, which will lead to shock, wound sepsis, septicemia, septic shock, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, okay? Upper GI bleeding that can cause massive upper GI bleeding, Collins ulcer, it's a form of stress ulcer. Acute respiratory distress syndrome from inhalational injury. Acute renal failure, acute tubular necrosis, they could have DVT. Late complications include wide or dyschromic scars, hypertrophic scars, keloids, unstable scars, contractures, chronic ulcers, loss of body parts, loss of function, disturbance of growth, cosmetics, scar, cancer, okay? Margarine ulcer that results from a chronic scar. It's a form of squamous cell carcinoma. They could have psychological disturbance. This is a contracture from a neglected bonds or poorly managed bonds. Okay. You can see patients have lost the limb. You see this contracture. You can see some form of keloids here, contractures of the limbs. These are keloids from bones. Keloids, you can see this is actually disfiguring and it's not cosmetically appealing. You can see post-bones margarine ulcer. Squamous cell carcinoma arising from chronic scar. That is margarine ulcer. Okay. So one character of this um, margarine ulcer that makes it different from the classical squamous cell carcinoma is there is no lymphatic spread. It's local spread because most of the lymphatics are already destroyed in the initial burns injury, okay? You see, what are the prevention for burns? You have to take important, uh, careful measures. You can see scald is the common domestic burns that um, involve children. Young are vulnerable to scald injury. Um, you can see this. Even a cop is taking preventive measure, not holding a hot teapot, uh, holding the cup directly. So you have to be careful. On... So in conclusion, burn, burns is one of the severest form of injury that can happen to an individual. Okay? Most of the causes are preventable. When it occurs, 
prompt management is necessary for a successful outcome. So thank you very much for listening. Now we will move into the question and answer session. Okay. So we are going to move into the question and answer. So please, if you have any questions, you can indicate, then we start the interact. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, sir, you, you mentioned that um, bonds could cause a false increase in PCV. Uh, that will call the pathology. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, his question is that bonds cause a false um, PCV. He needs clar clarification. Okay. Okay, now what we said, you know, in bonds, there is loss of fluid, plasma fluid, okay? There is loss of plasma. Is that not so? so when there is loss of plasma, there will be hemoconcentration. Mm -hmm. There is loss of plasma. This will now lead to what hemoconcentration. And you know, pack cell volume is a function of red blood cell and what plasma. You have the RBCs here and the plasma. So if there is loss of this plasma, you have a false because of what hemoconcentration after rehydrating the patient after rehydrating the patient you will now get the actual pcv of the patient that's why hb is more representative of patient true hemoglobin concentration because it is not affected by the hydration while PCV is affected by dehydration. When a patient is dehydrated, you get a falsely elevated PCV. It is after rehydrating patient, you, and he's making adequate urine, you now repeat the PCV, which will now show you the true picture of his hemogram. Is that clear? But if you do HB, because this is not affected by dehydration, you will get the true value. Is that clear? <clears throat> yes, sir. Yes, any other question? Yes, sir. I have a question on the concerning calculation of total body surface area involved. Yes. Uh, um, for instance, we say the uh, arm. Yes. The upper limb is uh, nine percent. Yes. So the patient has uh, like uh, bones in the anterior half of, of the anterior forearm. Yes. Besides having other places, like say the trunk. Yes. So, so when we want to calculate that part involved, how are we going to allocate the percentage? Okay, that's a good question. You see, when we showed the image or the diagram for Wallace's rule of nine, he showed the anterior part as well as the posterior part. And he was allotting the various percentages, okay? If the, uh, what do you call it? The... The arm is 9%. All of the arm is 9%. Let's say this is the arm. Okay. It's 9%. So it means the anterior half is 4.5%. And the posterior half 
is 4.5%. Is that clear? Then half of the anterior half, okay, is 2.25%. Half of the anti, uh, the posterior half is 2.25. So all you need to know is the entire arm is 9%. Half of it is 4.5, okay? Is it clear? So, yes, yes, it is clear. Thank you. And there is one more, sir. Yes. Uh, say the uh, a patient presenting with bones, third degree bones to the uh, entire right thigh, sir. And there is first degree bones to the uh, leg, sir, the entire leg. How are we going to calculate the total, I mean, the estimate? Estimate of what? Bones, like the light lower limb, there is third degree bones to the entire thigh, and then there is first degree bone to the uh, uh, leg. Okay. Shin and the leg. Now, estimation. The estimation is not the depth. The Wallace's rule of nine is not estimating depth. Okay. It is estimating percentage total body surface area, okay? Irrespective of the depth, is it clear? Yes, sir. Uh, you are describing have a mixed thickness, okay? He has a mixed thickness of 18%. The tie is full thickness bonds, while the leg is partial thickness bonds. So it has nothing to do, the percentage has nothing to do with the thickness. Thickness is an assessment, different, it's a different assessment, okay? The percentage is the total body surface area involved. Is that clear? Yes, sir. The last question, sir. If the percentage of uh, bonds does not reach the level at which we uh, the patient will need fluid resuscitation side so we still need to calculate the uh, estimate the percentage of it yes in the first place how do you know that it has not reached? you have to estimate for all bonds part of your assessment part of your assessment is to estimate the percentage bonds okay you have to estimate, after your general physical examination, you have to estimate percentage bonds so that you classify the bonds, whether it's a minor bonds or it's a major bonds. Is it clear? So in all bonds, yes. all bonds, even if it is 1%, estimate that, yes, this is 1% bond. Is it clear? So all bonds need to be estimated, not necessarily uh, major bonds or not necessarily bonds that will require fluid resuscitation. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yes, more questions? We still have time for questions. Okay, I have a question. Okay, you can go ahead, please. Okay, the skin grafting, is it available in Nigeria? Yes, skin grafting is a routine, um, it's a routine procedure that is done in the bonds unit by the plastic surgeons, okay? They, um, in fact, they do skin grafting, partial thickness grafting, full thickness grafting routinely in their operation list, okay? Is something that is done regularly in the plastic surgery unit. And um, for, for full thickness bonds, you know, you have to excise the wound and graft to prevent uh, contractures. So early wound excision and grafting is very essential for full thickness bond because if you allow them, they will not heal. You have to excise and harvest a graft from, 
other side that is not burnt, maybe the, uh, the tie or the back of the patient and you graft the area. Uh, one more question, sir. Yes. Uh, what is the significance of uh, honey application to bones injuries, sir? Okay. Now, you see honey is a dressing agent. Okay. Honey is used in wound dressing. It contains an antibiotic. Okay. In the bean that prevents growth of bacteria. But at the acute phase of burns, it's not honey you apply. Honey is not applied at the acute phase of burns. Honey is applied for a granulating wound, okay? The acute phase of burns, you copiously lavage with water. Water at room temperature, please. So honey not only in burns, ulcers, other forms of wound, you can use honey for dressing. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay, it appears there are no more questions. So since there are no more questions, um, I think we are going to end the meeting here and um, tomorrow we'll continue. Thank you very much all for participating. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you very much.